Hello and welcome to GCV Analytics webinar. Today I'm very excited because we are going to be talking about the energy sector and here along with me I have as a guest speaker Erin Hallock, um, Senior Principal of BP Ventures for Europe and Asia. Erin um, joined the BP Ventures team as a Senior Principal in July last year. Previously, uh, uh, she served as an investor and she was also a, a founding member of BFG uh, between 2011 and 2017. Um, previously, she's also served as Associate Director at Barclays Ventures between 2007 and 2011. Um, in terms of her academic background, she is an alumna of uh, University of Washington. She's also spent some time at the London School of Economics and holds an MBA from the University of Chicago. So. Um, Aaron, uh, delighted to have you here as my guest speaker. Thanks for uh, doing this webinar with me. No, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, all righty. So before we before we get into uh, the sector analysis per se, um, I would just like to uh, take a couple of minutes to acquaint the audience with uh, who we are and uh, what we do at GCV. Um, so. So just as a quick as, as a quick background, Global Corporate Venturing is our main publication, uh, looking at how corporations invest in uh, startups, either directly by taking minority stakes in them or indirectly through LP commitments in VC funds, as well as how they interact with the broader innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem. In addition to GCV, we also uh, run its sister publication, which is called Global University Venturing. Uh, that deals with innovation stemming from academia and subsequent equity rounds that uh, university spinouts uh, happen to raise. Uh, we are currently developing a third one, the Global Impact Venturing, which revolves around the impact space and how governance and environmental issues translate into the development of uh, venture investment portfolios. Um, we do the uh, GCV Academy which uh, is a two-day course on how to go about setting up a CDC unit if you consider setting up one and it takes place uh, in different cities around the globe and the academy is led by Paul Morris who is a veteran corporate VC investor. Paul led uh, the corporate venturing unit for Dow Chemical for many many years and the program also features many external speakers from corporate VCs and even traditional VCs who share invaluable knowledge and insights with the uh, participants. So if you're considering setting up a CVC, this is probably the program um, you may want to sign up for. And all of these uh, projects, uh, along with uh, GCV Analytics, before I forget, that's our data, data visualization tool, which uh, uh, takes uh, the data on who's been doing deals and uh, what they've actually been doing, turning those data into insights, which we could use as a service and, uh, of course, in our sector reports. Um, and all of these, all of these projects uh, sort of fall under the umbrella of the GCV Leadership Society, which um, aims to bring together the leading CDC uh, firms from around the globe and foster a strong investment community. And indeed, the members of, uh, of this community um, come together and meet at various events and uh, conferences which we organize around the world. Uh, right now, uh, we are actually holding our fifth annual event in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, under, the, uh, under the brand of Corporate Venture in Brazil. Um, we, we've also run some other local conferences, such as uh, the GCV uh, Synergize, uh, which we held in, uh, in New York in uh, late September, just a few weeks ago, um, as, well as, uh, as well as our delegation in Tokyo, as well as our um, event in Israel in March earlier this year. Um, however, our two most frequented conferences by um, CVC investors uh, that really bring together hundreds of corporates worth trillions of dollars in annual revenues combined um, are the GCBI Summit uh, in Monterey, California, which takes place in uh, late January, and our GCBI Lon uh, GCB, uh, London Symposium, which uh, takes place normally in, uh, in late May. In terms of our next upcoming events, uh, we've got a, a pretty relevant one, actually, uh, and related to uh, today's presentation. 
GCD Energy event, uh, which will take place in uh, Houston, the oil and gas capital of the world, uh, on November 20th and November 21st. And after that, of course, we have the uh, GCV uh, Innovation Summit uh, in Monterey, California, which I already mentioned, uh, which will be taking place on January 29th and January 30th. Um, I think uh, for both events, uh, there are still some applicable discounts. So if you haven't got your tickets yet, it, this might be a good time to do so. And um, for those of you who are maybe interested in um, our data services, please visit uh, gcvanalytics.com and request a demo. And uh, anyone interested in our publication or other services more broadly in our events, please feel free uh, to reach us at uh, info at globalcorporateventuring.com. Um, now, before, oops, excuse me. Now, before we, before we move on to the uh, sector presentation, uh, I would like to remind, uh, to remind everyone in the audience attending the webinar live that uh, they could send uh, their questions through the control panel of the webinar tool we are using, uh, which must be appearing somewhere on the right hand side of, uh, of their screens. Uh, so please type in your questions under the questions section and um, Aaron and I will try to uh, answer them at the end of the presentation when we'll uh, hold a brief uh, Q&A uh, session. Um, it seems like uh, we have uh, quite a good number of uh, live attendees, so uh, there's probably going to be uh, a few questions uh, afterwards. Um, now let's uh, let's uh, let's dig into the uh, sector. So um, when we talk about the energy sector, um, it, um, it it's appropriate to start with a bit of a, a bit of a definition. So what do we understand by the energy sector? What does it include uh, in our analysis? So um, the way we see it at GCV, it includes it, it encompasses uh, a, a range of uh, different areas, uh, including renewables uh, and sustainable energy tech, oil and gas technologies, energy storage management and grid tech, uh, energy software and analytics more broadly, energy utilities and uh, any adjacent uh, sort of uh, innovation and other energy related uh, enterprises. So it's a fairly broad definition uh, that we use. And um, when we use a fairly broad definition, uh, we can't but um, talk about a little bit about general trends in the sector. And the energy sector, um, it must be borne in mind, uh, fuels most econo economic activity there is just by, by its very nature, by what it provides. Um, and one of the most exciting things in, in recent times uh, that we've been seeing happening is that uh, innovation in sustainable and renewable energy sources has been on the rise. And um, this has been thanks to other adjacent technologies that have enabled it, such as batteries, energy storage, uh, grid tech, and, and so on. Um, and um, here on this slide, I've placed a few data points uh, from other industry reports that uh, global, global investments in renewables uh, stood at uh, nearly $273 billion in 2018, outpacing investments in fossil fuel generation and in other uh, type of fuels, uh, by the way. And um, that energy storage installations worldwide are expected to uh, really mushroom within the next two decades. Um, however, there seem to be some uh, some challenges down the road that uh, industry uh, industry will have to face. And uh, the um, in, in in particular with with the with the topic of decarbonization. Um, according to a McKinsey uh, estimate, a McKinsey study, com a complete decarbonization uh, of heavy industry would cost anywhere between 11 uh, to 21 uh, trillion dollars within the next three decades and would require way more non-carbon generated electricity than uh, we presently produce in the, in the entire world. Uh, so there's quite a few challenges and here I would like to uh, I would like to really engage our guest speaker, Aaron, uh, from BP Ventures, um, because I know BP Ventures really places emphasis on 
the low carbon world of tomorrow. So Aaron, would you like to briefly acquaint our audience with BP's investment thesis on this uh, broad space? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess, yeah, backing up a bit. So what BP Ventures is set up to do is really to invest in cutting edge technologies to support the energy transition. Um, and the way that we look at that is, is that we have five focus areas in addition to our traditional upstream business, um, which will be essentially fossil fuels. Um, so we, we make a small portion of our portfolio every year is usually in investments in supporting um, our upstream business, but that's about making that industry cleaner or more efficient. And then the bulk of our portfolio um, is committed to five areas to support the energy transition, as I mentioned. And so those are digital, mm -hmm. uh, which can be anything from quantum to AI, uh, to it, it could be a consumer app. Um, and then we're also interested in bio and low carbon fuels. Um, so these would include things like our investment in Fulcrum, Fulcrum which is a US-based business which takes municipal waste and turns that into biodiesel for jet engines. Uh, that also includes an investment in Solidia, which is a cement technology that produces or emits less carbon than traditional technologies. Uh, carbon capture and storage, which is I feel like fairly self-explanatory, but it's about thinking about new technologies for capturing and storing carbon versus traditional technologies, which is essentially just burying the carbon. Um, mobility, which is anything around um, moving people smartly, principally in, in congested urban environments, um, but we've also have a small investment um, in a business called uh, Allison Group, uh, that is about moving people um, in the air and it's about using excess capacity on on charter jets um, rather mm -hmm. than that, those legs going empty it's about reselling those to try to drive utilization and efficiency off of that um, and then well, it's a pretty um, broad thesis <laughs> it is right. and then the last one is power generation and storage um, which is fairly broad but that really captures sort of alternative ways of generating power and then storing them. And some of that will also overlap with some of our investments or some of our thesis around mobility, because of course it plays into EVs. Right, right. And um, now here, like one of the underlying themes of, uh, of, of my sector report and of this presentation is, a, is really, um, is really focused on renewables and sustainable energy tech. So do you think uh, this sort of revival or this bullishness, if I can call it that way, is likely to be sustained in the coming years, given technological breakthroughs that have been made, or uh, is it something momentary? I don't, you know, I, I guess, you know, one way of, of you know, asking the question is, is this just a fad and this is a trend, which is a blip and it's easy to support um, in a bullish market. But when times are tough, is this something that investors mm -hmm. shy away from? Is this something where um, capital becomes scarce because if it, 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 it's a novelty? And I think the answer is no, principally because we all know that we don't have sufficient um, fossil fuels to meet the demand you know the you've got you know a convergence of ever accelerating demand but reducing fossil fuels so you've got to meet that through you've either got to reduce your consumption or you've got to meet that through alternative energy right. and i did what we don't see is a reduction in energy consumption and certainly um you know, with population growth, I just think it's highly unlikely. And as some of the right. emerging markets get access to power, its demand isn't isn't decreasing. And there's real genuine commitment in a lot of areas towards this. And, you know, speaking for BP in particular, we recognize um, that in order effectively to be a going concern, 
BP is going to fundamentally have to change. It will not be exclusively a fuels business, which is really our role in BP Ventures is to facilitate that transition for the organization in parallel with the sort of wider energy transition. And so it's investing in technologies to, to meet those, what I wouldn't describe it, I guess possibly then saying, you know, trends isn't appropriate because really uh, this is a fundamental shift and I think it's a permanent shift. Um, it's not just right. an aberration in the way that we're either generating or using power. Hmm. Right. Um, right. And uh, yeah, it, it totally makes sense given uh, wider geographic and demographic trends. Mm -hmm. um, I um, so actually uh, one of the one of my next questions uh, related to um, to to the information on general trends that I've included on my on my next slide uh, refers to um, refers to really. Uh, how if if you guys invest in uh, in some sort of coal oil and gas innovation tech whether in upstream or or downstream uh, kind of related uh, startups um, because uh, oil and gas uh, oil, and oil, oil and gas majors are um, really susceptible to uh, commodity prices essentially so anything that could increase operational efficiency is uh, welcome in the short and in the medium in the medium term while we still do rely primarily on on fossil fuels and while fossil fuels are still the main the main actors on, on the scene kind of thing so what is the what is the sort of the sort of um or core innovation tech that uh, you guys have been investing in within our core business yeah um so it's about making that business more efficient mm -hmm. effect, you know effectively to reduce operational costs and to maximize the output we get from those assets equally it's about trying to clean up those technologies you through carbon capture so one example mm -hmm. is um uh, of an upstream investment that we've made to kind of drive efficiencies is uh, in a business called Blue Ocean Seismic Sensing, which manufactures subsea um, unmanned, uh, effectively sort of miniature submarines that go around and they're able to drive efficiencies with our offshore assets. Mm -hmm. Now the that's, current- that's really interesting. And and it, so it, and it's basically because you're trying what you're tr trying to do is sort of getting more oil out of those wells and using mm -hmm. these submersibles. The application today we're seeing is principally for fossil fuels. But what we're also saying is if we if in future we have a large installation of offshore wind assets, could it not monitor those and do some remote at least maintenance triggering question we don't know yet because we they've not the, the 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 technology hasn't been trialed in that area but it may be that bp never invests heavily in an offshore wind farm but that might be a market for the business itself and so if we're trialing testing and building the prototypes because it's a very early stage technology we're facilitating that um, but then also going back to kind of your question what are we doing to kind of invest in our traditional upstream we also have an investment in a business called sea capture which is around carbon capture but it's an alternative technology rather than bearing the carbon uh, mm -hmm. and so hopefully it then makes you know our fossil fuels business a little bit cleaner or we can apply this technology to try to clean that up uh, mm -hmm. but most of the most of the upstream businesses are like Blue Ocean, where it's trying to drive efficiency, or the other way of looking at it, it's trying to drive ROI on those assets. Right, right, um, and with with a very inspiring sort of uh, sort of technology. Right, um, so very similar, very similar to uh, the oil and gas uh, industry is uh, also the area of uh, electric power power utilities, uh, which. Uh, have been kind of subjected to uh, rising capital expenditures here on the slide I have uh, I've quoted uh, 
a Deloitte, a recent Deloitte report uh, on their capital expenditures. But another wider trend uh, across uh, any uh, sort of energy related services is uh, something that analysts tend to call customer empowerment and enrichment of technological choice. So what this really seems to refer to is uh, the energy consumption awareness being raised among consumers and consumers wanting to, uh, you know, in a way exercise uh, that well exercise their choice on how much of a of a carbon footprint they they leave. So I, I just wanted to ask you to what extent have you encountered this phenomenon among consumers and probably the customer base of some of the startups you you invest in, Erin? Yeah, I don't think we touch a lot of this just because most of our businesses are b2b and right. we don't we haven't invested in anything that touches utilities or even i think power generation yeah mm -hmm. so i yeah but what what i will say is just our own market intelligence says you know there is an increasing um that, yeah that this you know i our research concurs with this report that there is mm -hmm an increase sort of desire for consumer choice but i would also add to that is also there's also an increase in what we would describe as sort of prosumers where you're seeing a lot of consumers becoming producers of energy themselves and then putting that energy onto the grid and sort of trading themselves right right uh well uh, some some people call it prosumers uh, others call it uh grid defectors <laughs> so I, I guess it depends on the, on the perspective there in, in terms of uh, in terms of the terminology but uh yeah it's uh we live in in, in amazingly interesting times uh in terms of um in terms of um, electric power consumption and electric power generation and, and distribution no doubt um, now let's uh, let's move on to the uh, corporate venturing venturing scene. Um, so we did track uh, 130 deals backed by energy corporates, not only oil and gas, um, between uh, September last year and August this year, and uh, most of them, um, actually a good chunk of them, uh, 51 uh, took place in uh, well were rounds raised by U.S. based. Uh, US-based startups. Uh, but here, I, I want to um, ask Erin again, uh, because BP Ventures does have a, a, a bit of a pretty global outreach. So um, I, I would like to ask you, like, what are the geographies you've invested in and what other geographies are you currently exploring to invest in uh, in the future, Erin? Yeah, so BP operates BP Ventures, you know, like our parent, operates globally. So we have an office in San Francisco um, and another office in Houston, and those two offices cover the Americas. Mm -hmm. Our office in London covers EMEA, and mm -hmm. then uh, and then with support from um, a team of three in China. And then we have a scout in Israel and a scout in India. And at this stage, um, the scout in India is very much in exploratory mode. That's a, a very recent um, position for us. And it's just to test the market there because we know I there see. is a lot of demand for our act. Well, there's there's a lot of techno technological innovation there, but there's also a lot of demand for areas that fit within our investment thesis. So we want to see what the market's like there. Um, we have in uh, the uh, bulk of our <laughs> Um, the bulk of our portfolio is is dominant. I mean, th those businesses are headquartered in North America, and that's less to do with a strong focus there or a bigger team, but more that we've seen more technology come out of the U.S. than we have elsewhere. But we have seen a strong increase in um, Israel mm -hmm. and a lot of um, activity within in, uh, China. We made our first investment in China um, this year. And we'll put, you know, depending on kind of timings and I feel like deal, deal activity always sort of runs off 
track slightly, um, but the objective is to close another investment there before year end. Um, but we see that as a strong growing market. We've seen less, um, sort of like this map indicates and like some of these businesses, we've seen less activity in Europe um, by comparison to those other markets and very little in Africa and South America. I see. I see. And um, our, our Africa and South America is, uh, you know, either emerging or developing markets, whatever the term we, we, uh, we might choose uh, of, of interest currently. Uh, is there any, any sort of uh, innovation that, uh, that's uh, piquing your, your curiosity? Yeah, I mean, in, in South America, we have um, looked at, you know, biofuels there, um, particularly with sugarcane. Um, mm -hmm. And in Africa, we see a lot of opportunity with things that fit within the circular economy. Mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't, I think the challenge with both of those markets is we haven't seen a technology come out of those regions, but we've seen technologies in other regions that can very easily be deployed to those reason, regions. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. Um, so um, a, bit of a fairly broad outreach uh, that you have in global outreach. Uh, well, this is uh, really inspiring work that you guys are doing there. Um, now, moving along with, uh, with my slides and my presentation here, um, we did see that the uh, energy corporates invested mostly uh, in things like emerging energy. So we did see 61 61 deals, uh, mostly in uh, renewables and energy storage tech, um, as well as some areas that are adjacent, you might say, or in synergy with uh, the energy industry. Uh, so in, in um, AI, big data analytics, or cybersecurity in terms of the 24 uh, investments in, in IT. Um, in transport, obviously the, the hottest areas uh, revolve around um, autonomous uh, and electric electric vehicles um, and in terms of the industrial uh, sector investments um, most of the, most of the exciting uh, exciting things there revolve around robotics automation um, unmanned aerial aerial vehicles and even uh, aptech so um, for anyone for anyone sort of knowing the strategic patterns and strategic interests of uh of uh energy corporates uh this uh this sort of graph shouldn't be that much of a much of a surprise um now if we if we look at uh the co-investments uh of uh of energy sector ventures we we do see a, quite a wide uh variety of emerging startups so ranging from Things like data analytics and um, energy software solutions like Mana, Bitchley, uh, Autogrid, or Cosmotech, uh, here through energy efficiency and measurement solutions like SenseHome and Innowatts, um, clean tech and renewable energy like Etagen, United Wind, Level 10, um, carbon dioxide capture tech like uh, carbon engineering. Um, also things like uh, control valve uh, valve um, producers like Clark valve and um, charging station for electric vehicles even uh, like charge point um, here so uh, quite a wide variety quite a wide variety of uh, sort of startups that we see from different from different areas so um, Erin, I, I just wanted to ask you here because um, the oil and gas corporate VCs are probably amongst the most collaborative set of uh, corporate VCs um, with each other in general. So I just wanted to ask you if um, if you have uh, co-invested with any other uh, CDCs from the industry, and uh, what has uh, has your your experience uh, been doing that, or probably probably with other energy related uh, energy related uh, corporates, maybe not necessarily um, maybe not necessarily oil and gas. Yeah, no, I mean co investment is probably part and parcel with all of our investments. So we almost without exception, look to co-invest with others. 
and that's really a recognition that we don't one we don't have the complete answer um two we bring a set of skills and our competitors or peers in the industry bring another set of skills and if we can leverage those uh or we can, you know, provide, you know, either leverage those to develop the technology or provide the business with two strong referenceable customers that will only help their development um, and support their success. So we, you know, we've invested alongside most of the, the oil and gas majors. We've invested, um, yeah, mostly, yeah, we, we, you know, with, with, you know, these names are all very familiar to us and we'll continue to do so equally. We often look to invest aside, uh, invest alongside traditional um, financial investors. So either venture capital funds or private equity funds who might operate slightly differently um, in that they have a different investment um, horizon period, but again, they bring a different set of skills and that is useful and beneficial to the portfolio companies. Right, right. Um, so it's uh, it's all about uh, collaboration in this very, very risky uh, sort of uh, asset class that venture capital, venture capital really is. Um, moving along um, with our slides here, um, if we look at the evolution of uh, investments made by energy corporates, uh, we do see that uh, they did go up from 2017 to 2018, as this uh, graph shows, both in terms of uh, number of deals and uh, in uh, total estimated dollars in those rounds. These are total dollars, not just uh, corporate committed dollars. Just clarifying that uh, for, uh, for our audience here. Um, and uh, the same upward trend seems to be all, uh, also the case already by the end of uh, by the end of August. There, there's been more more deals made made by sector players um, than than in previous years. So um, I just want to ask Aaron again: um, Are there with you know a bit of a fear and a bit of a, a bit of a talk of a looming recession just around the corner? And all of that is really expected to put a bit of a downward pressure on valuations. So have you observed um, such a thing already in the making? Um, and do you think uh, corporates will continue to do venturing um, even, in an, even during an economic downturn, which, uh, in, in which or during which uh, they may be able to make investments at a discount really yeah it's a good question um i mean in terms of your first question on valuations i wish i was starting to see a depression in valuations but i think so not yet <laughs> no not at all um i mean i would say sort of you know whether you're looking at it as a multiple on a multiple basis or just absolute valuations but i still think um you know there, there's they're still sort of increasing upwards albeit Perhaps at a you know, not if I look kind of year on year, it looks like the increase um, in maybe multiple expansion has tapered a bit. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of whether or not corporates will continue to invest in a recession, um, I mean, I would argue that they almost have to because in many ways, you know, large corporates by their very nature, tend to be slow, tend to be less nimble than earlier stage businesses. And these are, for many of them, this is where the innovation comes from. And so if they're going to emerge ahead of the competition on the other side of the recession, they've really got to continue to invest in mm -hmm. their venturing arms. For BP, um, you know, BP Ventures has been around it through sort of one and, a, you know, arguably probably two economic cycles, and they have continued to um, support our venturing activity, albeit our investment thesis has changed, and I could see that, you know, happening, um, or it could right. be that the size of the fund contracts just as budgets across the group contract, but it's really, for many of these organizations, it's the innovation engine, so it has to continue um, to exist. Right. Right. Um, 
now on on this graph i did um i did give um i, I did give our our audience a bit of a, a bit of a ranking of the top uh, top investors over the past year of top uh, energy uh, corporate investors and um, um obviously we we find uh, some of the uh, usual suspects: uh, Shell, Total, RWE, and uh, and BP. So um, all of you guys seem to be seem to be investing uh, quite actively over the past um, 12 months, and probably even more. Um, so that's uh, that, that's really really a good sign, <laughs> if um, you know if if, if anything, um, for the moment, at the very least. Um, now, if we look at a if we look at a ranking on the top corporate investors uh, from the energy sector and from other sectors in energy businesses, uh, it's again uh, mostly mostly oil and gas majors that we find we find on top: Shell, Equinor, Total, uh, Chevron, NG. and uh, well, except for NG, uh, that's all of them are probably oil and gas majors. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, it, it, it does seem to be a promising, promising at the moment. Um, now, if we if we look at the evolution of uh, investments in uh, corporate back deals in in emerging energy tech, uh, we do see that um, it's renewables and energy storage that are the two areas that have really picked up uh, in recent years. Those are the um, dark blue and the light blue on on the graph here. Um, so my question here would be: um, Do you do you expect these areas to continue to be um, the hottest ones in 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 the coming year or in the coming let's say couple years, or do you expect other other emerging tech to uh, to sort of uh, become uh, become the the next uh, big thing. No, I mean, I think if if you're looking at it exclusively on an energy basis, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't be, you know, I think these will continue to probably be the leading um, investment areas, particularly around um, energy storage and management. Um, that's about, you know, effectively managing things more effectively and again renewable energy because that's about meeting the, the demand which isn't going to be met through fossil fuels exclusively and I think the other areas where um, there will be an increase are things which are probably a little bit harder to quantify as direct you know because they're not directly related to the energy sector and those are things around quantum AI so it, analytics big data um, which isn't covered exclusively in sort of the peach category you have, because that's mm -hmm. energy software and analytics. I think this is IT, which is probably sector agnostic, but certainly has very strong application to certain sectors like oil and gas. Right, right, right. And uh, when I, well, well, yeah, and the uh, and the possibilities which uh, quantum computing could open up in terms of industrial IoT. Uh, uh, probably, uh, probably mind-boggling. Um, so, so yes. Uh, moving along with, uh, with our presentation here, uh, on this spider diagram, I did, uh, I did try to summarize corporate co-investments in energy, energy-related uh, sort of startups. So, um, without going into too much detail, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that what it illustrates. Is that uh, energy corporates are very comfortable co-investing with corporates from other industries like transport, like industrials, and uh, and even financials, as you as you already mentioned. Um, and you know, there's really a, a whole like amazing variety of, uh, of startups and energy innovation uh, that's represented here on this uh, little spider diagram. Um, so what, like, what I would really like to uh, ask you is, uh, is you know, for instance, here we we see um, we see some some names of startups of areas that uh, um, that you guys uh, are really interested in, like uh, ChargePoint, for example, or Carbon Engineering. So would you would you like to briefly talk about those those two areas? That, 
the area of carbon capture technology and the area of uh, well uh, charging for electric vehicles which are expected to be the next big thing um, within the coming decade or so yeah sure um, so yeah so BP um, acquired charge master in 2018 mm -hmm. um, which is effectively a, it, it's a very similar business to charge point so these are charging points um, for electric vehicles and so we we followed that investment just it's run as a business unit, so it's not within BP Ventures, but it's something that we see as interesting because we're interested in that whole ecosystem around EVs. Um, and we have invested in some technologies um, like StoreDot, which are around um, the creation of a rapid charging battery. So, and we look at things in that ecosystem about grid management. Uh, so that was interesting to us and we watched that quite closely. We also, um, watched carbon engineering. Um, carbon engineering, for those who aren't aware, is a direct air capture technology and carbon engineering's um, direct air capture technology does this in a closed loop where the only inputs are water and energy and the output is a stream of pure compressed CO2 and then this compressed CO2 offers a range of opportunities to create products with environmental benefits. Um, particularly clean burning liquid fuels. Um, so that was really, that's very interesting to us because obviously it's a very clean and very simple way of doing that. We know that we are big producers of carbon and we've got to manage that. So we look at carbon capture um, and storage and it's about making a lot of it, it Yes, we've invested in carbon capture, but that will, um, carbon capture through sea capture, but that will not be our only investment in that area. Um, we're constantly looking at other technologies in that ecosystem because it's still very early days to say which technology will win or which technology will win in, in which geography. Right, right. Um, really, really inspiring um, types of technologies as well. Um, as uh, well, as this is uh, this is a presentation based on um, on a sector report that I wrote, and uh, which people could uh, read in our latest uh, our latest uh, magazine issue. Um, I did uh, I did include this uh, this sort of table with uh, top deals done by energy corporates, um, but um, rather than rather than going into um, too much detail about uh, each and every single one which people could read about on, on our web either way um, I, I'd really like to uh, to ask you about um, about a, a deal that you seem to be excited about when we spoke about doing this webinar um, you it, it's it's about it's about a deal in a very interesting interesting area related to uh, fish of all things, and um, I'd love for you to uh, share um, a bit about that deal uh, with uh, with our audience here. Yeah, so when um, we were preparing for the call, I asked if it was bad form if I mentioned my own deal as sort of something I thought was interesting. We had we had obviously talked about charge point a bit and carbon engineering as some that I thought were interesting, and then one which probably didn't make the grade simply because it was a slightly smaller round, um, but is a business called Callista. And Callista uses microbes, so little tiny bugs, and with methane gas, converts that into feedstock for aqua, aqua and agriculture. And effectively, what's really interesting to me about this is it, it's, it's creating proteins from methane gas in the simplest of terms, but it's able to do that without any requirement of water, um, which we know, you know, there's water shortages and, and access to water in a lot of geographies is a challenge. We know with climate change, there is food insecurity in a number of areas um, across the globe. Aquaculture is, you know, a dirty industry and very demanding on resources, as is um, agriculture in terms of um, livestock rearing. But if you're able to do that in a way that's broadly clean by feeding animals methane, you know, proteins 
from methane gas. That's really interesting. Um, is it something that humans are ready to consume quite yet? Probably not. I mean, I, I can imagine marketing execs right. working hard to try to sell this um, without much success. But in terms of aqua and agriculture, it's you know, it, it, it's a fairly sort of simple and straightforward sell, and it's a nice way of taking a product and converting it into something very useful in a way that is resource unintensive. Um, if anyone thinks it's remotely interesting, there is a great video that kind of explains it all. Um, but if you search for Callista, um, it's literally sort of the first thing that comes up. Um, but it's quite interesting and it explains sort of how this might then play into the various themes I've mentioned in terms of food insecurity, agriculture, aquaculture, water demand, etc. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting, uh, as you say, and kind of an inspiring investment. Uh, but how does it, um, how does it fit uh, with, uh, with BP's uh, strategic um, overall thesis, if I may call it that way, and uh, was it in any way related with a particular business unit of BPs? And uh, you could just uh, elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, I mean, so I guess kind of backing up, you know, you mentioned strategic value, and we always um, look at both sides of the coin. So we look at what is the strategic value to BP. And mm -hmm. what is what is the you know potential financial return, and both are equally important to us. In this instance, we looked at BP as providers of the feedstock, effectively. Um, so you know, basically, we could supply the methane gas. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, in BP's history, so this is going back, you know, several you know, I think a decade or so. BP actually had a division in pet food. Um, mm -hmm. oh. So I don't, you know, this wasn't an attempt to sort of re recreate that division, but it, you know, it wasn't so off piste for us, but it was very wow. much as a supplier of the feedstock um, is the way that we looked at the strategic value. I see. So a, a pretty, uh, that's a pretty interesting, pretty interesting strategic fit. In a way. Um, right, so I, I'm conscious of time um, because we try to finish these webinars within within an hour. So I'm going to try to uh, try to do the rest of the slides uh, as quickly as I can, engaging you uh, only on occasion. Uh, so we could uh, we could have a brief Q&A at the end. Um, so in addition to in addition to deals, we also try to track uh, exits uh, that involve corporate corporate ventures and um, whether whether they involve them as uh, exiting investors or probably uh, in some cases even acquirers. Um, however, in the energy sector, we do see uh, fair, a fairly small number of exits. Like over over the 12 months we looked at in the report, there were only three. Uh, in Europe-based um, Europe-based startups, um, and if we look at the overall uh, the overall evolution of the number of exits for corporate ventures that we've been been trying to track, there haven't been that uh, that many of them really, and this this has to do with uh, the fact that energy startups um, in the majority of cases, unless we're talking about perhaps things like energy related software are harder to uh, harder to scale would just take longer time to scale uh, to become exitable or acquirable uh, and um, probably in some cases even more capital capital intensive um, so we could probably attribute this sort of development um, to that um, in terms of funding initiatives uh, because we also try to track uh, any sort of uh, funding initiative that may be related to energy uh, energy startups in terms of newly launched CVC units or um, VC funds uh, that uh, get to have corporate relevant corporate LPs, corporate backed uh, or um, corporate uh, financed uh, accelerators, incubators, and uh, and so on and so forth. So we try to track those, and um, we did see that the number of such initiatives did remain stable. 
uh, on year-on-year -year basis from 2017 to 2018. Even the number of uh, the number of dollars seem to uh, seem to have risen uh, substantially uh, from about just north of uh, half a billion to uh, nearly 3.7 billion, uh, as this graph suggests. Um, in 2019, we we see a bit of a, a bit of a slowdown. We're yet to see what the results will be by uh, by the end of uh, December. Um, in terms of the top funding initiatives, uh, there, have been, there have been plenty of interesting ones. And just to mention, uh, just to mention a few, Schneider Electric uh, launched its uh, SE Ventures uh, unit and uh, kind of announced it, made it public. Um, Aaron Innovation Capital um, raised its uh, its first uh, its first fund. Uh, National Grid Partners was launched in uh, in the U.S. Uh, by National Grid. And, uh, and many, many others. And finally, I'd like to briefly touch on um, innovation coming out of universities. Um, so we did see that the deal flow in university spin outs from the energy sector went up in, 20, in 2018, along with uh, deal flow in, in such enterprises. Uh, in other areas, as we already saw in this presentation and this report. So I'd, I'd like to briefly engage Erin again um, and ask her, what are BP Ventures' touch points with academia and what is the sort of innovation you see and you uh, find coming out of, uh, out of universities, Erin? Yeah, we have a couple of sponsorship programs with universities um, in a, you know, a number of, basically in geographies where we have physical presence. Um, uh -huh. And we work with a number of um, university investors um, to, and also some investors that focus almost exclusively on commercializing university generated IP. Um, one investment that kind of sort of summarizes this nicely is is C Capture, which was a spin out um, from Leeds University. Um, and we're actively looking at a number which are university spin outs. I see. So so it's a fairly good variety and of, of useful tech coming out of out of there to kind of sum it up, right? Um, all right. Yeah, well, I mean we're that... seeing a variety of, of different technologies. Um, and I would say there's probably a slight sort of, you know, depending on the university or the geography, there's a slight skew to the type of technologies that we're seeing coming out. But mm -hmm. you know, certain universities will naturally have a bias towards certain activities, whereas others will be biased towards others. I see. I see. This is interesting and probably a very fruitful source of uh, source of innovation for, for you guys. Well, that kind of concludes my presentation um, of the report here. And um, now I was hoping we could uh, get a few a few questions from the audience, but uh, it doesn't seem like uh, doesn't seem like anyone has submitted any. So um, if you allow me, I'm going to ask you one more question and if there's no other questions submitted by the audience i'll um we'll we'll briefly uh wrap up and conclude this program but my my last question would be is bp and you know oil and gas in general attracting interest from um corporates from other sectors such as mining for example um, to see how they use tech and uh, CVC to improve their efficiencies and sort of cross frontiers? Um, not to my knowledge. I mean, there's other sectors, so other CVCs where, you know, we certainly share ideas and network and, and that, but um, the mining example, you know, I, I don't know. No, yeah. I mean, I think it's you, just you more sort of generally. To mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. Right, right. Uh, no, I'm, uh, the reason why I'm asking, particularly with focus on on mining, is uh, because I on some of our events uh, that gather energy related investors, uh, I do see people um, representing uh, mining companies. Um, but there seems to be mm, 
a bit of a reluctance on their part to talk about their their venturing activities and their venture investments. They they just uh, go pretty much under the radar and uh, and undisclosed. But uh, they do happen to uh, frequent to some of our, some of our conferences, which uh, which is something that uh, really uh, really caught my attention. <laughs> um, Particularly, uh, particularly the Houston conference, which, which is very much related and focused, uh, uh, related to and focused on on energy. Um, so, so I was just wondering if there's uh, there's any any sort of uh, unusual suspect that you that you kind of uh, you kind of see uh, in either from that space or or from any other space, really, uh, really just uh, just I was just curious. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, it's it's about, I suppose I, I'd come back to, it's about doing the right deal for BP. And so if there was a another CVC from a sector we hadn't touched, you know, we'd absolutely entertain that. But equally, if someone reached out to us and thought what we were doing was interesting and wanted to learn and leverage from our experience, we would entertain that. Um, I think it goes back to sort of on your earlier one of your earlier slides about co-investment, you know, I think it's really about collaborating um, to try to get the best for, or to, to try to be able to deliver the best for a lot of these very disruptive, very early stage companies. I see, I see. Um, well, it doesn't seem like we have any any questions from the audience submitted, so um, so I do suppose we can uh, we can wrap up. Uh, I would like to thank you once again for doing this. Uh, this this webinar with me, I was very excited to, um, about every question I, I asked you, Larry. Really, so um, thank you very much, Erin, for your for your time and uh, and for doing this. Um, now, um, in terms of uh, in terms of logistics of, of the webinar, um, everyone who signed up for for this webinar will receive will receive uh, the a copy of the slides as well as the uh, video recording of the webinar and um, that should probably be ready in the next uh, in the next day or so um, stay tuned for our next webinar which is going to take place around mid-november and it's going to be focused on the financial sector um, really excited about that one too so um, thanks very much Erin once again um, Thanks everyone, um, every one of the attendees who uh, did attend uh, this this great webinar uh, live today, and um, have a good um, day, afternoon, or night wherever you happen to be in the world. Goodbye.